There we go. So afternoon, everyone. And yeah, thank you very much indeed for inviting me to come and speak with you. This session is going to be in two parts. Um, I have a batch of stuff all hanging on a PowerPoint with a film clip here and there to help. Um, but the way that this, the, the session will work is that we have two hours today and we have two hours next week on the 26th. And we will use today partly to for me to share certain elements about a communication framework that we use within hostage and crisis negotiation. And then um, next time we'll actually go into some of the stuff such as influence and maybe challenging conversations and maybe some more of the elements. And we will start it by discussing challenging conversations so that, that thread is right through the whole thing. Um, I suppose it's worthwhile explaining what I'm not going to do. Um, I'm not here to tell you that the way you communicate is flawed in any way, um, it, not, not for a minute. You would not be where you are if you didn't have the communication skills, experience and knowledge. Um, what I'm going to share with you is what I call a Mary Poppins bag. I have full of communication tactics, phrases, terminology, understanding the human behaviour and a whole thing wrapped around the only tactic we had in negotiation, which is what we say and how we say it. And I'm really basically going to say, let me open that bag and take from it what you want. And if there's anything in there that you can weave into what you already do to support good communication that, and really make it fit for purpose for you personally, then that's what we're going to do today. Um, well, today and the, the next day. So let me bring up just a little bit of a PowerPoint first of all. I'd like you to start by thinking, and we'll go into breakout rooms just shortly, so you can do this in the, the privacy of groups, um, but to consider what communication challenges you, um, what troubles you, what eats up your time, what creates barriers, basically the communication stuff you want to avoid but can't. And by having that right at the start of our session and thinking about that, what happens is that our um, the framework that I share today will already help you make sense of some of that stuff and maybe even give you tactics that um, uh, before we even get to that stage. And you'll have that at the forefront of your mind. And there's also another thing about sharing it, because sometimes we feel it awkward or we don't ever get the time to properly sit down and just say, here's what I find, choose me up. Here's the difficult stuff for me. Um, and we sometimes don't find time. We don't feel that we're free to say that. Well, today it is. The next two hours is completely yours. And it's quite nice to be able to share the challenge and stuff because you'll realise you're not on your own. So that's sort of how we're going to start the session. But it's only fair that I give you a little introduction into my world so you can sort of work out why on earth it, you know, I'm, I'm speaking about this topic. Um, I, was, I was policing for 32 years and a massive part of that within hostage and crisis negotiation. Um, the majority of our work was deployed to people in personal crisis. So that is suicide intervention in the main. And if we think of it through the science of communication, our ability to connect, understand, communicate, influence and change behaviour had to be done pretty quickly. We didn't have months to work that one out. We had to move quickly. And I'm guessing that probably akins to an emergency situation for you where you are experienced, you're knowledgeable, um, you're trained, but when an emergency happens, there's still a, a, an emotional response within us that makes us human, that makes us sharp, that brings the adrenaline to the fore and helps us deal with that. And that's exactly the same with negotiation. Anything um, spontaneous brings emotion and it has to. And a bit of what we did was understand, well, we can't change that. So how can we make that work for us? And that was woven into our framework. At the other end of the spectrum, we had kidnaps and hostage taking, and that would be just under 4% of our work. Um, and the majority were overseas, uh, Nigeria, Somalia. Um, one of the biggest ones I worked on was with ISIS. Um, David Haynes was taken by ISIS. He's a Scottish national, and that was in 2012. And that was an 18-month negotiation to try and get him home. Now, it never worked out. 
Um, and uh, the family have given me permission to talk about that, but I'd probably do it without um, off the record. So folks that are watching the record version of this, um, just to let you know, there'll be times when we record today and there'll be times when we put the, the recording off just because of the nature of the discussion. So you're going to have the full um, presentation, but you're not going to have the discussion from everyone. You can do that part yourself. So but going back to that hostage negotiation, there's a, I'm reserved at calling anything about hostage taking routine, but the communication had to become that way. You couldn't operate in an emergency reaction for, for well, the longest one I did was four years. That was impossible. So what we have to do is still connect, understand, communicate, influence and behaviour change. We had to look at that package, but it had to be done a little bit differently. Now, we had, that's the two ends of the spectrum and everywhere in between we had anything from crimes gone wrong, domestic siege, aircraft coming in, renegade aircraft. I should say we never had any hijacked aircraft for real, but we did have threats of it. Um, and uh, yeah, it still focuses the attention, whether it's um, fake or not, I have to say. Um, but really anywhere where there was a communication barrier, our team were deployed too. Now, we needed a communication framework within that arrangement. It was flexible enough to meet every single deployment, whether that's the fast moving or the slow stuff, but it had to be robust enough that we could lean on every time. So it was almost a framework, a set of rules that we would stick with. And it's that that I'd like to share with you and ask you to transfer it into your world. So that's a little bit about me, folks, um, a little bit about the start of the session with the discussions. So before I create and open the breakout rooms, any thoughts, reflections, anything anyone want to share first? And feel free to come on to the microphone if you do. I just hope those that came in a bit late, feel free to have your cup of tea, your slippers on, make yourself at home, make the next two hours completely about you, if you will. Any thoughts from anyone? Okay, let me create breakout rooms, folks. I think we'll have maybe four or five people in each room. We will make it for, let's say seven minutes with a 30 second round off. Now within the breakout room, I don't know who's who, the breakout rooms, the, it's just distributedly evenly. You may know each other, you may not. Um, but for seven minutes, please have a chat about the things that really cause you concern, maybe the communication challenges that you have that you wouldn't mind having a few extra tactics to deal with, um, things that you don't mind sharing with each other, and then we'll bring back. Now, when you come back, the, the recording will go off and we'll have a quick chat around the seven rooms just to get an idea of what it is, if there's any main uh, points, and then we'll crack on with the PowerPoint for the rest of the day. Okay, I'm going to open up the breakout rooms now. You should receive an invitation. Okay, so thank you very much for sharing challenging conversations. Anyone who's watching this on record, give yourself a couple of minutes to think about the things that really cause you a problem. And then hopefully the next um, part of the um, presentation will be helpful for you. So what I thought we'd look at today, folks, um, time dependent, and we are going to have a leg stretch halfway through. Um, part one, we're going to look at communication, just an overview of what that means. Have a look at human behaviour, both the predictable stuff and the unique stuff. The predictable stuff means that there's stuff that I know about you already. And um, Brid, you know this stuff. Alison, I know stuff about you and Joan and Richard, just because you're human and breathing. And actually, there's some stuff in there that's quite helpful um, uh, and we used in every deployment that I'd like to share with you. That's a definite for today. The, the, um, the unique stuff, um, so, so that was a predictable stuff. The unique stuff that makes you specifically you um, wraps up into the why do people say what they say and do what they do? And that's sometimes, you know, you might be actually thinking there, why are they so awkward? Why on earth do they have to practice it being so difficult? And the quick answer when you're confused or annoyed or frustrated by someone um, the quick answer to why do they say what they say and do what they do is because they can and because it works. There's an enabler there that's allowing that those words, allowing that behaviour to happen, and they must get something out of it. And in negotiation, that was a, a riddle that we would keep in mind saying, why are they saying that? Why are they doing that? What is it they get out of it? What's allowing it? And if you can work that out, 
we would then think, well, what can we do differently that allows them to achieve the same outcome? Um, and then ideally looking, listening differently today or the first part of next week. Uh, next one is really making the skills work for you. I know that I'm going to share a bit about timing. I've already alluded to that. We'll maybe look at influence and influential language as well. And then really tactics to specifically look at the questions that you've shared. If you end up with a few more questions by the time you arrive back next time, don't worry, we'll weave them in as well. Um, I suppose communication, that's the definition, folks, the partner exchanging of information by speaking, writing or using some other medium. And it makes communication sound incredibly simple. And I think on that basis, maybe through life, we don't really give it um, really specific um, uh, consideration as a topic, as a skill, as an art. Um, because if you think of it, when we're babies, we definitely learn to communicate. Any of you that are parents will know that babies can tell you exactly something's not right. They then find a voice by parrot fashion. We, uh, we copy our parents, we copy other people. We find that voice and then we learn formally to communicate through writing at school, through pronouncing words properly, through English. But the actual art of conversation, connecting and agreeing and disagreeing is mixed up in there and we find our own way with it, which means the communication, unless you've had any specific training, the communication that you now use today is your own formula, the stuff that works for you. Now, a lot of that will be really good, um, but there'll be bits of it that you've left behind because it was awkward. Um, and if I can share even some of that stuff um, from what I call my Mary Poppins bag full of things, it starts with this. That framework of communication I spoke about at the beginning that we lean on for every deployment starts with this. It's the law of approach and the law of avoid. And the strength of this is in its simplicity. And it basically says that we approach the things in life that we like and we avoid the things in life that we don't. So allow me to come off of the share that point. So if you just think of it, Anita, what are the things you enjoy in life that you invest time, money, energy and effort into? What are the fun things? Um, spending time with family. Cooking, eating around the table together. Perfect. So it's fair to say that when you have the family around or you have a meal um, uh, um, waiting to be prepared or something, that's where your mind will go. You'll spend time preparing it. You'll spend money. You'll put effort into it with a smile on your face and joy in your heart. Is that fair, Anita? Absolutely that and lovely walks along the beach. <laughs> oh, let's add that in as well. So you can just picture already Anita, one of Anita's perfect days, you know, it would surround the stuff. Now, we psychologically and physically move to things that we like. Now, Joan, on my screen, you're sitting above Anita. What do you dislike in life? What do you definitely not invest time, money, energy or effort into? What would you avoid? You're on mute as well, by the way, before you share that. And this is dignity. I'm not trying to embarrass anyone. It's just the fact, folks, you can't listen to anyone talking for more than 10 minutes before you start thinking about other stuff. So it's really quite nice if we keep it interactive. So my intention is not to embarrass. Anything, Joan? Or are you? Nothing what do specific? I avoid? Yeah. Um, what do you dislike? In, in relation to communication? No, just in life. What do I dislike? Um, loud, aggressive people. <laughs> yeah, fair um, enough. Um, How do you feel about busy city centre traffic? How do you feel about rainy days and cold weather, that sort of thing? I like rainy days if I'm running in it. Um, and yeah, I don't like crowded shopping centres. I don't like shopping, believe it or not. Oh, um, oh, no. yeah, you have your sister here. I don't like going into crowded um, places, I suppose. I do like peace and quiet. I like the fresh air. I don't like claustrophobic sort of tight spaces. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, perfect. We, we, we gauge the picture there as well. So if, like Joan, you do not like busy, crowded places, you're going to avoid them. You get an invitation to a party that you you know you don't know people at or you just know is going to be busy then you're more likely to find a reason not to go so in life we approach the things we like and we avoid the things we don't and that's normal and human 
So how does that impact on communication? Well, it's the same with people, isn't it? We approach the people that we like and we avoid the people we don't. And then moving one forward, we approach the communication and the conversations we like and we avoid the conversations, the communication we don't. So basically that little um, um, rule in life about approaching what we like and avoiding what we don't actually was so strong that it became the foundation of that framework because we identified that when we create an approach environment, when we create an environment that makes people want to approach us, want to work with us, communication flows really well. So uh, I'd like you to think about um, how communication flows when you're with your best friend, um, you know, how that conversation goes back and it slides back so easily. There's no difficulty, you chat, they chat, and it's almost as if it's, there's no barriers whatsoever. It's on a complete slide. And that's, that's what leads to great communication. You then have, think of someone maybe you've walked away from, um, somebody you've fallen out with or a job that you've left or you know, you, you've know um, basically, you've not communicated with for a while. And you can see that that avoidance means that communication cannot flow. And when communication doesn't flow, when there's that avoidance, it's not gonna work and the magic can't happen. So you can't go into passing on a message, you can't go into good communication, understanding, you can't move into influence and you certainly can't encourage effective uh, change. So avoidance means that communication can't flow, but there's a bit in the middle. And the bit in the middle is effectively what we've just spent the last half hour speaking about, and that's the communication challenges. And if you can visualize a communication challenge, the reason it is a challenge is that we would like to avoid it, but we can't because of the consequence. I really don't want to have that conversation. I really don't want to go into that, but I have to. Because if I don't, here's the consequence of what will happen. So when that happens, we call that, co that communication jaggy. So if you think of it, we've got smooth conversation when we're with someone that we enjoy hanging around with and good co communication. We have no communication with those that, we don't, that we've broken off from. And with those that we're having challenging conversations, it's jaggy. And what we mean by the jaggy is that we will communicate, but we'll pick up the bits that matter to us, the bits that we can then use. So I'd ask you just to think back to one of these conversations maybe you've had where it was difficult. The, the, the person wasn't fully receptive or you weren't in a, a, a comfortable position. You just didn't. That communication went, but it was uncomfortable. It's not going to be as effective as if you were on good terms. So for us to get our job done effectively, for us to get it done in effective time, there was a strategy, an actual tactic of saying, how do we make people want to communicate with us in a kind and considerate way? Easier said than done. You'll have people who do want to, and then you'll get people who really only communicate because they have to. So I'm gonna share with you a few tactics that we used, but the first thing was that awareness. So even you've mentioned meetings here, how do we bring people online to want to be at the meeting and how do we encourage an approach environment at that meeting? I have to say from the police, the meetings that gave you a good cup of tea and a nice bit of cake were the first because people wanted to go there and usually good, easy communication was done round a table. Um, and actually, when you mention um, Anita about round a table, having a meal together, um, that there's something very connecting there for everyone. Sharing food in every culture is a big connector. So even at a meeting where you're gonna have a cup of tea and a bit of cake, and we've lost that a bit with Zoom and Teams, that creates the general chat and the nice communication that makes people the start the communication sliding. So we would think, you know, how can we encourage this approach? How, how do we do it? And we'd actually get to the point where we'd say, right, in this job, we'd take a time out and say, are we, the words we used is, are we going forward, are we going backwards, or are we going around in circles? Approach, avoid, or jaggy. And if it's anything other than approach, can we do anything differently to make this more effective? Sometimes we could, and it was obvious, sometimes it wasn't, and we just had to run with the jaggy stuff until we tried to get it smoothed out. But that became the framework. What can we do to encourage approach? So that's at the foundation. We're now going on to about emotion and how we used emotion, but any questions on that approach and avoid before we move on? Maybe giving an example. 
um, if, well, Brid, you'll know this one um, because I think I probably used it within the masterclass just because it's such a good one. Imagine Brid and I work together, folks, and um, I'm just about to leave the office for the night and all I did was put a dirty coffee cup in the sink. And the next thing Brid is giving me, you lazy mare, do we think you, do you think you're here just to put your coffee cup in the sink? And we end up having this big old set too. You just called me lazy. If you were maybe busy or you would have maybe have a coffee cup now and then. So you can see that communication. It's not like friends sliding back and forward. We haven't completely avoided each other, but it's jaggy. It means what I'm hearing for, from Brid is the bits that I can use to throw back at her. What she's hearing from me is the selective bits. We're listening negatively to each other at that point. You'll grab the bits that you can throw back at me. So you could argue there's communication, but it's not effective and it's not going in a helpful way. If we then go our separate ways for the evening, there is no communication at that point until I settle down and think, we've been working together for years. Why on earth are we arguing over a coffee cup? Now I think tomorrow I'm going to go into the office and I'm going to speak to Brad about this. Yet I'm now sitting thinking that's going to be difficult. It's going to be awkward. It's going to be weird. Oh, my word. Can I avoid? Can I can I start at a different time than her tomorrow? I wonder if I could take a sickie. And that's the stuff we would do to avoid because that's human. Now, think of the words I'm using. That self-talk is difficult, weird, awkward. I don't look forward to tomorrow. All of these words are more avoid words than approach words. Imagine if I then do the self-talk and think, Tomorrow, I'm going to clear the air and just have an open discussion, an honest chat with Brid. I'm going to say, sorry, get back on track. So open, honest, back on track, sorry. All of these are more approach words that people will warm to. So we can self-talk, avoid or approach. So even within your teams, when you hear the discussions going on amongst your staff, what's the self-talk? What is the talk to each other? Is it encouraging avoidance? Is it encouraging conflict or is it encouraging approach? And um, you mentioned um, communicate compassionately. And that's what we speak about. Compassionate communication is actually slidey communication that's kind. So there we have it. Brid, uh, I'm, I'm keen to come in now, but then Brid's maybe sitting at home thinking, oh, I don't want to see Kathy tomorrow. This is going to be weird and awkward. So a little WhatsApp message to Brid that said, I'm sorry. And we had a phrase which was, sorry, thank you, please, our three magic keys. And we actually used them because if you're in difficulty, if there's a communication hiccup that's anything other than approach, usually one of these words will help you. I'm sorry, that came out wrong. I'm sorry, that was received a different way than I intended. Thank you for, for digging in there. Please let me share. So you can see at different points, these are really, they're words that sort of diffuse things. So I'm giving uh, Brid a sorry and I'm saying, I'll send her a WhatsApp message. Can we clear the air? Can we get back on track and just have an open chat tomorrow? Suddenly she has an invitation to approach rather than avoid. Are you taking it up, Brid? Are you going to take that? You yeah. are. Thank you. So we've got a better chance. That approach means that communication has got a better chance of working earlier on than if we go in having said nothing and then there's awkwardness. And you will know from your experience that if communication is allowed to grow on the negative, on the avoid or on the jaggy, it becomes disproportionate to that a coffee cup. It's not about the coffee cup, it's what it represents. And suddenly the negativity becomes something that it didn't need to be. It grows over the years and suddenly you end up with conflict over a coffee cup. So that's what I mean by approach and avoid. Okay. I'm conscious of time here. We've got another little bit about, I think, um, emotion, and then we'll maybe go for a leg stretch. Any questions, feel free to pop them in chat. I might not see them myself, but I know Levette's keeping an eye on. So if we go back here to the next slide. Now, um, folks, I'm respecting the fact you will be emotionally intelligent. You'll have been around emotion the majority of your career. So this isn't so much about emotion. It's more about how we used it within our framework. Now, if we accept that emotion is fundamentally a part of being human, it doesn't matter who you are, where you are, there are 8 billion people on this planet and we all have emotion um, uh, at different times and different levels. 
I'm hoping just now that emotionally you're emotionally neutral, you're comfortable, you're happy, you're content, in which case the seesaw here will balance out. When a seesaw is like that in terms of emotion and logic, communication flows back and forward in equal measure. But when emotion is high in any person, it means that emotion is high, logic is a bit low, communication can only flow from the emotional person to the logical. It has a really hard job going from someone who's not as triggered, someone less emotional, to someone who's highly emotional. Why? Because emotion impacts on every area of communication. So if we try and come off share. If I ask you now um, to think of a time where you were, uh, you had emotional moments that you were triggered. Now, it could very well be in the work environment where you think that things just frustrate you or anger you or upset you. You may only have to think a week away to remember an emotional moment. You may have to go back to your teenage years when you were, you know, trying to find your way in the world and arguing with everybody. But compare your communication then to what it is now and think about a conversation that you could have. How the communication changed. So compare now to then pace, pitch and tone, how we spoke, that would change. The word choice. We have a filter, don't we? We have a filter that said what I think, what I really want to say, and there's a tact filter that allows it to change into something kind and considerate. When we're emotional, that filter reduces and sometimes disappears altogether. And therefore, there are times where communication goes straight from our thoughts to our words. And that, although it tastes good, sometimes it tastes so good, it's actually sometimes unhelpful in the big scale of things. That's what emotion does. It impacts on our ability and our desire to listen. So the higher someone is emotionally, the less they will be able or be willing to listen to the other person. So Brid and I arguing over a coffee cup, we're not really listening to each other. We're just picking up the key points because we're listening selectively and our ears don't want to, and we've, we've no desire to listen to the real meaning. We want to disagree at that point. So high emotion brings limited listening. So you can tell already that emotion we used as a barometer is, when do we talk, when do we listen? If somebody's emotional, it's pointless talking because they're not gonna hear the real message of what I have to say. Now, the good thing about listening when someone is emotional is that, remember the pace, pitch and tone and the filter, they will give you far more clues about what is going wrong, how they feel about things when they're emotional than they ever will when they're logical. So there's a real positive to somebody having an emotional vent in your presence. It'll save you time. Um, um, just to round this off, because I want to come back to that, that, that emotional vent, um, and just to round off that emotion works quicker than logic every time, which means emotion will always be on display. It does not matter how good we are at covering up. Nonverbal communication, particularly in the face and the hands, is shaped by emotion. It's fueled by emotion. And that is on display all the time. And it's on display quicker than our ability to cover it up. Any of you that are parents will know when your child is telling you lies, when your child is telling you one thing while something else is happening. You'll know your friends. You'll know even when someone comes into the office and you say, how are you? And they give you, yeah, I'm fine, okay. You know you can read that they're not fine because there's something in the pace, pitch and tone, how they say something, how they move, their facial expression that tells you differently. So emotion, if emotion has such a significant part in communication, it makes sense that we need to use that to our advantage. So going back into the emotional vents, in any deployment we had, commanders always on their strategy to us would tell us to reduce the tension in the stronghold. The stronghold is the person or the place that we are negotiating with. And that's a valid um, direction. That's our job, get the tension reduced. Why? Because the commander does not want any person in there acting on emotion. When we act on emotion, we may do some significant things that are difficult to repair. That's fair. As a negotiator, when we heard somebody venting, so verbal through emotion, we were actually celebrating it because it saved us ages of work, hours of work sometimes. Because when emotion is vented, there are so many clues wrapped up in there 
that get to the crux of the matter of what really matters. So that emotional vent from Brid to me about a coffee cup cuts through the coffee cup, cuts through really something, you know, the, the, the moment and gets to the crux of the matter. Because if you think of it, my comment back wasn't, oh, the coffee cup's causing you an issue. The coffee cup was, well, maybe if you were as busy as me, you'd have a coffee cup from time to time. There's a story wrapped up in there. There's a feeling wrapped up in there that I've clearly not said in my calm, logical moment, but I absolutely have said it in my emotional one. So emotion is actually there and it can put us on the back foot, particularly when somebody is aggressive. But if we can look at emotional vents as being actually an advantage, it's not a bad thing. It can help us control our emotion around someone else. So that's how we would coach and use emotion. We're not getting away from it. So how do we make it work for us? So that's the next part of our framework is that make emotion work for us. Understand what it does to us in terms of communication so you can then use it to your advantage. And we would save time just by not trying to speak when it's not going to be heard. Any thoughts? refreshments or I mean anything that you have that you feel you can share please please do because you have a whole load you have your own Mary Poppins bag of experience and it saves you listening to me chippering away <laughs> anything from anyone else how do you deal with emotion when you hear it to your advantage maybe Blue. pop the recording oh. off Kathy oh yeah yeah good call there we go okay so the recording's back on so the next part I'd like to share with you is um, a thing called core emotional concerns. Bring the, I'll operate some of them over slides. <clears throat> now, core emotional concerns, what I'd like to explain is what they are, where they came from, <clears throat> uh, how maybe we use them within negotiation. I'll keep that one to, I'm cautious of time. I want to keep that to a minimum, but it, there is a sort of, by sharing it, you, you can see how you can read and use core emotional concerns or how we did. And then maybe ask you how you can think about using them within your environment. Um, so first of all, core emotional concerns. This was um, something that was uncovered by Roger Fisher and Dan Shapiro. They were psychologists attached to the Harvard project in the 1980s. Now, what they uncovered, specifically at that point, negotiation had been done more on a transactional and factual and logical basis. And they identified that that wasn't worthwhile, that wasn't working. It's actually emotion underpins negotiation, how we feel about things underpins negotiation. And what they identified is that as human beings, now this is everyone, 8 billion people on this planet, um, as human beings, we all need to feel five things in order to be content and happy. Five things that influence us to feel, you know, that seesaw, that, that up and down seesaw, to feel content, emotionally balanced and fulfilled. And these five things are so much of a need um, that we migrate to people and environments that help fulfill core emotional concerns for us. So you can see already that by fulfilling core emotional concerns, it creates an approach environment and it is so much of a strong human need that people cannot help but approach. So this is a tactic we would use with people that maybe didn't like us, who really didn't want to work with us, but they couldn't help themselves when we used this. Now that makes it sound contrived, and I'd like you to park that feeling of contrived tactic because actually it comes down to just genuine kindness, but let's capture it in, in its entity. So number one, appreciation. Um, maybe I tell you a good way to um, sort of put this into perspective is Think about maybe a job or a team or a relationship that you have left in the past. And you'll find that core emotional concerns have really been at the crux of why you've walked away. And then think of an environment that you love being around, that you just, um, um, whether it's with your family around a table having a meal, whether it is on holiday in the sunshine, whether it's coming to work and working with your team, Think of an environment that you love, that you even have a spring in your step looking forward to being in, and you'll find that core emotional concerns are fulfilled. So keep that in mind as we go through it. So number one, we all need to feel valued and appreciated for what we do and for what we do to be recognised by those that we expect. Basically, someone else to see our perspective and to recognise it. 
Now, what we worked out, and although this isn't part of um, Shapiro and Fisher's finding, what we worked out is that there's an, a language of love, um, and that one knits in perfectly to appreciation, in that there are five ways in which we show and, um, and receive appreciation. Number one is verbal. So Eva, if I was to say to you, thank you so much for coming in early and dealing with the early calls and the early patients or um, the early paperwork or whatever it is, thank you for doing that. I know that you don't need to, but thank you. There's enough in there for you to know that that is a genuine heartfelt thank you. It's not just thanks for that. It's actually thank you for, and then a bit of the detail. Is that fair, Eva? Yeah, absolutely. So verbal, we need that. The next one is time, and many of you have alluded to how time is uh, really, you're fighting time the whole time. Well, time actually is one of those languages of appreciation. Making time for people makes them feel appreciated. People respecting our time makes us feel appreciated. Even the simple thing of being on time for a meeting. And if there's any of you organise meetings and folk fall in 20 minutes later, and you're feeling upset about it, it's understandable because actually that's a direct correlation with how we feel about being appreciated. When you have patients that say, oh, that doctor was fabulous, he sat with me for 10 minutes and I know how busy he was, that patient is telling you that they feel specifically, they feel appreciated. They have mentioned time. Now, these two things are safe. It does not matter the culture. It doesn't matter who it is. You can be reasonably safe in that showing appreciation through what you say and offering time will be well received. The next three are relevant, but you maybe sometimes have to know the person. So service, I can show appreciation by doing something. So Lavette, you and I working together, you've got a busy timetable um, and I bring you a coffee. I say, look, I know you're busy. There's a cup of coffee there's probably a nice little glow that you'll think, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. That feeling of appreciation. But what happens if I think I'm going to take that a step further because Levette's um, filing tray is overflowing. And I go, actually, Levette, I cleared your filing tray as well. Now we're getting into the realms where you really need to know the person before you can do bigger acts of kindness, bigger acts of service. Now, it might be that Vet says, oh, that was the best. Somebody clearing my filing tray is just the bee's knees. But you may also go, leave my stuff alone. Don't touch my filing. It's one of these balances. So know the person before you do anything big. But little random acts of kindness usually sit OK. Um, gifts. Um, people. Some people are gifters. They just want a gift as a representation of their appreciation. And um, if you do have people that gift you things, who bring in the cakes, who remember the birthdays, that's them basically saying that's one of their strong ways of showing appreciation. Make sure someone at some point shows appreciation back to them in the same way. Um, it's not as common as obviously a thank you or a time one, but gift is one of those um, languages. And um, to make gifts effective, because sometimes we can feel a bit odd about receiving a gift, particularly if we feel that it's disproportionate to whatever has been done. Um, a gift usually has to have a little label that says, thank you for looking after the cat, looking after the house. Thank you for taking my shift over Christmas. Um, there has to be a recognition and a label attached to that for it to sit comfortably. And finally, touch. The majority of you um, will perhaps be in an environment where touch is OK, especially if you happen to be frontline with patients. You will hold hands, you'll put hands on shoulders. Touch, you really need to be in the right environment, in the right place to have that take effect. At home, just think of it at home, giving your, your siblings a, a hug when they need it. Um, you know, um, uh, that's probably the most, um, uh, the, the place where it, it's most um, uh, appropriate, and appropriate is the word I was looking for. A negotiator who can't find her words, folks, don't trust me. <laughs> touch is most appropriate, definitely at home and with the people you know. Touch can be completely inappropriate at work. So you have to know that one, but it's still part of appreciation. It's just gauging whether it's appropriate or not. So in summary, these five things, we need to feel valued and appreciated for what we do. And when we do, we get that lovely feeling of the seesaw balancing out. The next core emotional concern is affiliation, a sense of belonging. We need to know that we are part of a group, that we belong, that we can be in an environment where we can trust each other. We can be vulnerable. 
And we don't get that everywhere. And if you can be yourself in your work environment, then you know that you are in your tribe, that you belong there. If you're sitting on the sideline thinking, I'm really not part of that team, then what's happening is your affiliation has been compromised and you will feel a negative emotion rather than a positive one. Autonomy. We all need to feel that we have a freedom of choice, a freedom of speech, um, freedom to make decisions that we're not being cornered into a situation. And I suppose COVID's the easy one to look at. Look at the way that it dictated how we lived and how we worked. Um, and so, you know, being able to accept that is sometimes very difficult because we felt we were being um, uh, really controlled by this virus. Um, within a work environment, um, sometimes decisions will be made and you'll think, well, we're, you know, I don't mind the decision, but I do mind that I wasn't consulted. So this goes into change and that is coming back to some of the things you said at the beginning about change. How do you affect change? Well, actually, most people don't mind change. We just don't like being changed. So i.e. we have to feel that we've contributed. We have to feel that our voice has been heard. We have to feel that um, we've been heard, understood, respected. So that autonomy is massively important to us. Status. We need to know that we're important. So it's not for what we do, it's for who we are. Unconditional positive regard that says, okay, you're not perfect, none of us are, and that's okay. In short, you matter. When you walk into a room, you're noticed. When you walk out of a room, you are missed. And that is important. And then the last one is our role. We need to know our purpose, our purpose in life, our purpose each day, that we're working towards something that matters. Um, just imagine a day where you've been super busy, chasing your tail, you go home and you think, I have nothing to show for what I did today. And think of that flat feeling that goes with it, that disappointment, that despite best efforts, and compare that to a day where you've been equally busy and you have a whole load of things that have been ticked off the to-do list and you feel so accomplished and compare the feelings. It's almost, you know, grab me a cape and a pair of Superman pants because I'm superhero powers today. I've got my to-do list done. Um, that's how I was working towards a goal and we all need them in life. And the other element of our role is our reputation, what we stand for. Is what we expect in someone, do they live up to that? Is the title I hold representative to what people expect of me? And that maybe is sometimes the miscommunication. Put a label on you, such as a pharmacist, such as a manager, such as change. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know what that would be called within your environment, but um, improvement, perhaps. Put a label on you. People have immediate expectations of that role. Now, depending on their world, it might be a positive, it might be a negative, it might be neutral, but they'll expect you to live up to certain things on there. And sometimes that's fair and unfair. It depends. So um, taking that role into us as negotiators, we would try when we deploy to incidents not to be in police uniform. Because as soon as that uniform was present, it sent a particular message of my role to people. And quite often we were dealing with people who had a negative feeling about communication. Uh, sorry, a negative feeling about uh, police officers. So immediately our communication was on a really difficult approach. Avoid, they want to avoid. If I force them to talk, it becomes jaggy and ineffective. So how do I let them see beyond the title or the uniform? And sometimes I have to describe it and say, look, I know that what you see is a uniform. Look beyond that. I'm Kathy. I'm trying to help. I'm just another human being who sees someone else in a tough situation. Please allow me to help. Um, and we'd try our best to let them see beyond the uniform or the title that we'd have. We encouraged our colleagues not to tell people, don't worry, the negotiators are on their way. What frame of reference do people have for negotiators but Hollywood? And you think, oh man, and then it's a competition. You're not going to negotiate me. So introducing us in our role, it would be just tell them, look, my colleague Kathy's coming. She's really good at listening to folk and helping in situations. You know, you, you let, let her in, let her help you. You know, she might be in uniform. Look beyond that. She's a good, you know, she's a good spud. Try and get them to identify the role in one that was approach. 
So our role is really important and we like consistency. And one of you mentioned um, how difficult it is when you communicate a change and then a week later it changes again, almost back on itself, almost a U-turn. We don't deal with inconsistencies very well. We like consistency and that's a bit of what we stand for as well. So there's a few things in there that are wrapped up with the core emotional concerns. So what we have in effect is a formula of five things that we all need as human beings, every single person, and it does not matter the age, the gender, the culture, the experiences, the position in a company, the position in the organization. It doesn't matter. We all need core emotional concerns to be fulfilled in order to feel content and happy. We all migrate and invest time, sometimes money, energy, psychological thought into environments that help us fulfill our core emotional concerns. And we walk away physically, psychologically, we detach ourselves from environments that don't support core emotional concerns. So how can we use that? I'm going to bring this up and then we will have a bit of Q&A over this. Um, let me share the screen again. I'd like you to go back to your happy place. Go back to where you would really like to be right now with the people that you love, with the people that you really want to be around, your tribe. It could be your basketball team. It could be your football team. It could be your mates from uni. It could be your family. It might be your work colleagues. Where do you belong? What makes you happy? And if you think of that environment in terms of core emotional concerns, you will realize that your buckets, and this is how I've separated them, um, each core emotional concern, think of it as a bucket. When they are fulfilled, your buckets are full. And when you're in environments that are great for you, these buckets are full. When you receive compliments, when you feel you're in control, when you feel that you are really connected, these buckets actually trickle over quite beautifully. Everything is on par. But there are things that happen that compromise, that begin to empty these buckets. And how do you tell? As soon as emotion changes from happy and content to frustrated, annoyed, scared, any negative emotion is a shortcut to tell you that it's not about the coffee cup, it's what it represents. It's not about the thing, it's what it represents. It's actually not about pay and conditions alone, it's what that represents. It, everything represents other things and when it changes in emotion, it falls into these five things. Appreciation, affiliation, autonomy, status and role. Think of a situation that angered you or frustrated you or maybe still does. You'll find that the bucket surrounding what that thing represents will be emptying. Example, um, I'm going to show you a film just shortly um, about how core emotional concerns, how it can be interpreted in different environments. But um, I suppose an example is email. We spoke about that earlier on. Have we all had emails that have come into our inbox that have immediately given us the roll up the sleeves, limber up the fingers for the heavy keyboard reply because, wow, we are going to get both barrels. And you, your friends can hear you typing. It is one of these e emails that trigger you. And then you don't send it or somebody tells you, wait till tomorrow. But it's cathartic, isn't it? You, you get uh, email. Now think of it, if you happen still to have that email in your in-basket, go have a look at it again in terms of core emotional concerns. It's not about the email, it's what it represents. And there'll be elements within there. As soon as emotion changes to the negative, I don't feel appreciated, I don't feel important, I don't feel connected, I don't feel that I have a choice, I don't feel all of the things, core emotional concerns. This gives you a, a reliable shortcut as to know why communicate it by why emotion changes. So how can you use this? Um, in negotiation, we used it. So um, if, okay, we'll start, before I go into that step, when our buckets are emptying, we actually all have coping mechanisms that manage us. For example, that email, your coping mechanism is to angrily type and then not send. It helps you top up your buckets again, doesn't it? But we all have different ways of coping with, with pressures. 
And rather than stopping the recording and asking you, can I offer out that it might be taking a walk on your own, having a, you know, calling your friend and having a good old vent. Um, it might be going to sleep. It might be going to the gym. It might be having a rant, uh, having a glass of wine, smoking, crying. We have coping mechanisms. We get our emotion out and we begin to top up our own buckets. But there are times when it doesn't matter what we do, our normal coping strategies no longer hold us in good stead and our buckets continue to empty. And when these buckets empty, we can go into personal crisis. And a little bit of why do people react in one way? You send the same message out and people react one way and other people react a different way. If there's an emotional reaction, think about their buckets. They may already have half empty buckets and this is just something that empties them a bit more. Other people might have full buckets and be able to cope with it. We all need all, all need core emotional concerns to be fulfilled, but some people need more of one than the other. You'll find there's some people need far more appreciation than other people. We're wired differently. They'll still need it, but not as much. So um, if we can think of it as buckets, it's helpful. Now, going into how we used it in uh, negotiation, just a quick um, um, explanation. Um, suicide intervention, and I know that that's a sensitive subject, so I touch it with respect and I'm not going to go into any detail with it. But if I was deployed to suicide intervention, I can reasonably expect that this person is in personal crisis, every bucket is empty. Because their normal coping mechanisms wouldn't have them sitting on the edge of a high place. Now, the good thing about core emotional concerns is that the reason his or her buckets are empty might be drug addiction, relationship issues, financial issues, lifestyle issues. They might be at the point where nothing is working for them and they see that ending their life is a solution. I cannot give them a job. I cannot help them with their drug addiction. I can't give them financial stability. So I effectively cannot fill the buckets up with what's emptied them. But what I can do is fill them up from what I can do. And that is with what I can say, what I can do within my abilities and how I can make them feel in that moment. And there's a lot of things going around, particularly within health just now, that you will have no control over. It doesn't matter how much you try and it'll probably frustrate you. It'll empty your buckets because you'll feel you haven't a say in them. But the thing is, we can help fill our own buckets from elsewhere. And that's where we would speak about in our world about when the rest of the world is fighting us, we can be kind to each other. And that comes from kind, considerate, compassionate communication and trying to understand each other. And in our own role as negotiators, we they wouldn't speak about buckets because that's a new thing that I've sort of used as an experience. But we do speak about the core emotional concerns. OK, what, what's what's undermining you? What's getting you? And I, I know you must feel either unappreciated or, you know, alone or something. But tell me what's going on here. So we would use them as a self-management tool, as a template. But we'll go back to the suicide intervention. I know that the buckets are likely to be empty, most of them. Well, what can I do to fill them up? Well, the first thing I would do is I would approach someone face-to-face, -face if, if by choice, face-to-face -to, -face to the point where I'm so close, I see a reaction from them that said, you know, get out of my space. We all have our own personal space. And at that point, I would ask a question and say, would it help if I stand back a little bit? I'm Kathy. I'm keen to help. But would it help if I stood back? And every time they would say yes. And I would. So if you think of it, I've started to fill buckets. Number one, I've given them a choice. I've not told them, OK, I will move back. I've actually asked them, would it help if I move back? They have the choice to say yes or no. I've given them a choice. And when they've said yes, move back, I've done it. They matter, what they're saying matters. And drip by drip, I will contribute to these buckets and start to fill them to the point where the seesaw, which is emotionally high, becomes balanced. And then we can have some meaningful conversation. I know that by contributing to these buckets, that person will want to work with me, will want to be around me, because actually all I'm in is in competition with an environment that's emptied the buckets. What I do need to compete with is the option for them to completely get rid of the buckets altogether. That's my competition. It's not the environment they've come from. 
So if you can start thinking about emotion and emotion changes in yourself and other people in terms of these buckets, what's emptying them, what's filling them up, where do I go, what do I do, what can I say to help fill them, it might be a visual and helpful tactic you can use as a way of um, making reliable sense of emotion and giving you a communication shortcut that works. So I'd like to show you a film clip now, and it's a, a compilation. And I've interpreted them in terms of core emotional concerns. There's a little um, a ticker tape on the bottom of the film. Now, it starts out in my world with a hostage. And um, uh, uh, um, Arkin was her last name. I've, oh, how sinful that I've forgotten her first name. She was taken as hostage in Australia. She was backpacking and had um, replied to an advert for to help on a farm. And when she arrived there, the farmer kidnapped her, um, shackled her in a shed where she was abused and until she managed to get her message out and was rescued. So she's been interviewed. Every film there um, is available on YouTube. You can watch it in its entirety if you want. So her explanation was, if you look at, think about it, she speaks about how she felt her core emotional concerns were being emptied, her buckets were being emptied. We then go on to a terrorist turned spy. It's just a, a few seconds of each. And his interview was about how he saw himself. Now he was responsible for a bombing in of the US embassy that killed a number of people, both local in Nigeria, as well as American um, officials. Um, he defected to the UK first, and I think he's now in America, and he's hiding in plain sight. There's been a number of attempts on his life, and um, when you listen to his whole interview, it's actually quite interesting. I'll make sure the QR codes are, for, uh, are in the chat for you if you wish. So when he speaks, you can see how his motivation is fueled by core emotional concerns. Um, we go into an ICU unit. Um, staff going into ICU when they hadn't been specifically trained during COVID, the demands meant that they had to go in there, their anticipation of going in and what they found when they were there. So fear is always control and control is always autonomy. So if you're apprehensive about something, it's your autonomy bucket that's getting filled and emptied. We then have a girl who went from a public, a, a, sorry, a state school into a private school to have a look and to experience it for a week in her reflections. And finally, just a frivolous one, Emma Thompson, the actress, um, being interviewed and looking back on a time when she did stand-up comedy. And every one of them, you can interpret core emotional concerns within. So I'll share that film with you now. You don't have any anything to say. You lose everything. You, you, your clothes, your freedom, your, your family, your friends. You feel very, very powerless and tiny. Yeah, you're stuck. Um, the idea of going and fighting the war in a foreign country um, that was seen as defensive um, in the defense of, you know, defenseless civilians, I would say. That was in itself honorable. I think I wanted to be part of history, uh, part of making it and shaping it, rather than being a spectator. And all, all I did, everything in my life, even when I went to Bosnia, was to protect. It wasn't my intention uh, to go out to the world and harm people. Everyone's really supportive. Everyone's in it together. I'm finding it very rewarding. A little bit nervous going into ICU, um, not really knowing what to expect, um, how it was going to be received, having non-ICU staff in the actual unit. Um, but everyone has been really welcoming, very, very supportive. Um, you know, you don't ever feel intimidated or afraid to ask questions. Um, I went out of my comfort zone and I like, did something new that I wouldn't normally do. And I think like, I'm proud. Are you proud of me? I'm very proud of you. <laughs> yeah, they've got it all set out. But I don't think I belong here. I don't think like I would fit in. I don't think I would be happy here. I feel like if you're going to a private school, you're almost like separated from the other half of the world. I'm not that kind of person that would want to come here. work. Transition isn't really the word for 
the hideous and life-threatening fear that stand-up mm -hmm. produces. Right. <laughs> so transition is not the word, more running, screaming. <laughs> In the opposite direction. Yeah. Because there's no character between you and the audience. It's just you. It's true. And if they hate you, they hate you. That's right. Not, Personally. Not, not Nancy. No holds barred. Yeah, exactly. Oh, exactly. There's no character to hide behind. Yeah. So just a compilation of different videos where you can hear our motivators in life are usually we like an approach to things that make us feel good. How we feel motivates us how um and it, it challenges us and it's all wrapped up with these core emotional concerns and when we think about um if you think of it um, right at the beginning when we spoke about um, um is it anita having a meal with her family uh where are we oh she maybe left oh anita there you are having a meal with your family walking on the beach your core emotional concerns will be supported with there and because it gives you a good feeling um, the feeling that you have, uh, was it Joan, about uh, avoiding busy, claustrophobic environments, that would empty your buckets. You wouldn't feel in control. You wouldn't feel appreciated or important. It, it, there's just something in there that, that makes you want to walk away. So it's all woven together. So if I coach nothing other than core emotional concerns, folks, if, if you can take this away and even for the next week or so, play with it. And how to do it is watch it in other people. Um, if there's something at home, you know, that maybe kids are having an argument or you see something on TV, um, a, a conflict or at work, there's that emotional fueled situation. If you can think about what's this really about and you'll come back to core emotional concerns and you can fill the buckets from a different angle. Now, it doesn't stop the other things still needing addressed, but it can help with communication at that point. And we would... Um, Every job that we deployed to in negotiation, we reviewed. And I know we have that luxury because we only had about 400 a year in total in Scotland. I understand it's about doubled now. But we would review it by saying, did it happen or did we make it happen? When we had the good, the bad and the ugly, there were jobs that went exceptionally well and we were celebrating. And when we got a hostage back home, for example, um, and I can specifically think of one that we had from Nigeria, it took us two weeks to get him home. We were cartwheeling in the corridors. It was such a good feeling. But we actually had to say, well, did it happen or did we make it happen? And would it have happened anyway, whether we'd been there or not? And that's what helps us make our framework um, so reliable because we then say, well, what was it we did? 100% of every review of what we did, core emotional concerns played an important part. Our reading of the situation, our fulfillment of them. Um, captain Alex, that was the, the captain that was taken in Nigeria, um, when he was taken, he went from being the captain of a ship where he'd been in control of that ship. He was with the company for over 40 years and um, he was known out there um, uh, locally, yet he was taken as hostage and he went from being that captain of the ship, all his buckets filled. Three hours later, he was in the Niger Delta in a cage being um, guarded by um, doped up youngsters, teenage lads with semi-automatic weapons his buckets would be empty. He would not feel in control. He certainly wouldn't feel appreciated. He wouldn't feel connected to anything that was familiar. And our job as negotiators, if we know nothing about him, we will start weaving in messages to fill his buckets, messages from his family, the tactics to try and negotiate him, but we'd always try and put in messages that supported that emotional need um, within him as well. How do we get... Um, uh, kidnappers how do we get people who have taken others who actually hate the world quite often to negotiate with us we fill their buckets we make them feel valued and appreciated because we pretty much know at the other side of them there is a whole strong environment that doesn't fill their buckets if we can they'll work with us so you can consider them in a caring considerate way and you can also use them as a conscious tactic um Either way, they have to be real. They have to be from the heart. And that's core emotional concerns for you folks. Play with them over the next week or two and see what you can see in them and maybe start delving into them. Um, and we can come back next week and maybe start with how it went. Um, easier said than done. But um, to put it in context, I would teach this over two weeks. I would teach it for a whole day and then we'd practice over two weeks on the negotiating course. Today, we've had half an hour explaining it. But there's still enough in there that makes it something tangible you can use. And now and then I, I get little messages from clients who said, 
I'll use core emotional concerns today. Oh, my word, they really helped. So that's that one. Any questions or thoughts or anything you'd like to chat through with core emotional concerns before we round off with our unique bubbles? Conscious of time. Oh, no, I'm not conscious of time. I'm now conscious of time. OK, the offer today, I realise three o'clock is our deadline, but I'm happy to stay on half an hour if anyone wants to stay and ask questions. Right. Allow me to do this bit. Listening will be at the next, as, in, as anticipated, at the next um, session. Oh, where's my PowerPoint? We'll round off with this. And this holds the key. In fact, we might start with this next week as well. As well as core emotional concerns being the predictable part of us, that's only a very small element because every one of us is unique. And I'd like you to imagine that the day you were born, you were born into a bubble, a transparent bubble, and you're still in it today. A bubble that people can see through and hear through, as can you. And at this moment on this call, every single one of us is in our own unique bubble. And we're going to be in that bubble until the last breath we take. In that bubble is every life experience you've ever had. It combines who you are, your personality, how you feel. Every moment of every day is wrapped up in that bubble and it forms into what you value, believe, need and want. Everything that motivates you, everything you think about, everything you do is woven in through your values, beliefs, needs and wants. Just think about it. What did you do this morning? Have coffee, have breakfast. What are you thinking about now? What are you going to do and think about later on? You wouldn't think it and do it if it wasn't important to you. And that important means it's either a belief, it relates to a value you have, it relates to a need that you have, or a want, or sometimes a combination of them all. And this is the essence. If we can understand how somebody ticks, what somebody values, believes, needs and wants, bearing in mind that core emotional concerns are needs, we actually have all the information we need in order to connect, understand and communicate. So how do I work out how you tick? Well, are you? is it fair to say, um, uh, Claire, is it fair to say that if we've just met for the first time today and the first thing I say, Claire, is I'm really pleased to meet you. Now tell me, what do you value in life? What do you believe in? What do you need and what do you want? Would that be an approach question or would that be an avoid? I am running down the corridor very fast away from you, Cathy, question. Um, on a first meeting, probably avoid. <laughs> too right. It's far too familiar, isn't it? It's a bit bizarre. It's very odd. It's not in keeping with our expectation. But when we meet somebody for the first time, we're losing a lot if we actually don't listen for all the clues that tells us how they tick. So I'm not going to say to you, um, uh, uh, how you know, what do you value, believe, need and want, Claire? But I am going to say, how are you? Tell me a bit about yourself. We're going to work together. How, you know, how do you work? And maybe what's the best place you've ever worked in? And I'm going to let you talk. And I'm saying let you. I'm going to give you space. I'm just I'm going to keep my mouth closed so that you can talk. And it only takes about three minutes for somebody to share a good crux of what is important to them, to them in life. Now, I'm not going to do it just now because time is tight. Otherwise, Claire, I'd ask you to maybe tell us about a perfect day. But I'll, I'll uh, mute you again and then I'll take you through a hypothetical. If I say to Claire, OK, uh, tell me about a great holiday you had or tell me about a good day. She might say, well, there has to be sunshine. There has to be outdoors. I want to be with my friends. And if I can, the family dog will be with me, too. There's a first layer within there. There's a whole clue about what she values, believes, needs and wants. Does she need her family, value them, believe in them? Does she need the holiday? In short, it is what is important to her. We only then, if we explore the layers and say, tell me more about that sunshine. Tell me more about your holiday. You mentioned your dog. Well, what's that to do with it? And then what happens is people open up a bit more of why the dog is important. Well, the dog's part of our family and actually it's a one way of getting the kids to go out and about and walk, you know, and actually take an interest in something other than computers. Oh, and then we explore about the computers and the taking the walk in the outdoors and outdoors represents freedom and not being cornered. In fact, staying away from the computer means that 
they uh, that you want the best for your kids to have an open mind rather than a closed one they you want health for your kids and you can explore the layers anywhere someone goes and in about three minutes you get a picture of what makes them tick now what are we listening for and that's what we'll, we'll, we'll speak in detail about that next time and i'll do a little refresh of this part but we're listening for the clues that matter and it has to be appropriate curiosity it has to feel right not an interrogation and the rule we would use is we would only explore the things that the other person mentioned if they've brought it up it's important to them and if they ever say why are you asking me that well i only asked because you mentioned it and i guessed it was quite important to you rather than our own agenda and by knowing that what we're listening for is what are the things that they're telling me that i connect on that are similar to me because all these bubbles our own life experience means that we are absolutely unique and in these eight billion people on this planet while we're similar in terms of core emotional concerns we are entirely unique in terms of our bubbles and we connect on our similarities so what we're listening for when someone talks to us is they might be in a different situation they might be in a different department but what do we have that we connect on so folks, what I'm going to do is I'm conscious that three o'clock is on us, that some of you will have time constraints and I want to respect your time through appreciation. Um, offer you half an hour now, anybody that wants to stay on and just have a chat through anything, um, you're welcome to. We'll put the recording off. And when we come back next time, what we'll start on is another revisit of this. We'll speak about core emotional concern experience. We'll touch about listening and then the rest of the time we'll go right into the stuff that matters to you. Um, I hope that has been an okay two hours, that you've not felt too much that things have been talked at you. Um, two hours isn't long. It flies really, really quickly. Um, and uh, But I, I do appreciate even giving up two hours is massive. So if you're okay with that, that's what we'll do the next time. And we'll come back to the bubbles and go into a little bit more detail. And Claire, maybe we will have time to ask you a little bit about your holiday at that point and explore the layers. We'll see. Um, any burning questions, please let me know. Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry, Lavette, you asked me to put anything in the feedback about You're your OK. I, I did it, Kathy, and people have been popping in feedback into the chat box function. You're fine. Oh, thank you. We'll also do it next time if you revisit on, on week two. Um, but that sort of rounds off. So I'm going to say thanks to those that are watching on record as well. I'll press the pause button and I'll see you at the next uh, part.